Perseverance, or more simply stated, grit, is a common trait amongst EMS providers. It grants us the ability to endure in the face of hardship when others may consider quitting or failing. In regards to COVID-19, we are all playing the long game. It is a marathon, unfortunately, rather than a sprint. We must stay united as a group and stay true to our mission of supporting and protecting our communities despite the pandemic. That is not to say that we are not human ourselves. While perseverance is one of the characteristics I value most in EMS providers, another virtue I'd care to juxtapose it to is vulnerability. In any situation that presents a threat, be it physical or emotional, our natural instinct is to protect ourselves. That's just basic survival. We try to defend, hide, or even deny our own insecurities and weaknesses. Being vulnerable involves letting yourself feel all the things, the good, the bad, and the not so pretty. And then also letting someone else see it all as well. Trying to be invulnerable can be exhausting. As much as we'd like to be superheroes protecting the population from medical maladies, we must also acknowledge our own humanity. This is easy for no one, and it's okay to express that and find support. When we numb feelings like fear, embarrassment, and pain, we also numb excitement, hope, gratitude, and happiness. Allowing vulnerability into our lives can rejuvenate our senses and actually foster, build, and restore our community and make us more connected. I'm including the link to Brene Brown's TED Talk on vulnerability that has nearly 50 million views and I'm sure many of you have seen. If not, it's certainly worth checking out. Thank you all again for always being in service and a very happy EMS week. Today's episode brings us two EMS physicians from Stanford on the topic, Where Have All the STEMIs Gone?, where we dive into the literature and statistics on cardiac arrest, dying at home, emergency department volume, and numerous other items related to COVID. Interestingly, both domestically and abroad, there has been a dramatic reduction in heart attacks, strokes, and traumas that have been presenting via EMS to the emergency department. We discuss potential hypotheses into this phenomenon and also explore other salient international details related to COVID. Our guest today, Brian David Sloan, is a current EMS fellow at Stanford University and did his residency at Harbor UCLA. He was an EMT in Los Angeles for six years before medical school and considers himself an EMT first and a physician second. He hopes to take an attending position at Kaiser South Sacramento, where he will also be working on many local EMS initiatives. Dr. Gregory H. Gilbert is a clinical associate professor of emergency medicine at Stanford University. He's medical director of San Mateo County and the EMS fellowship director at Stanford University. He grew up in New York State and received his MD from SUNY Downstate with distinction for investigative scholarship. He completed his emergency medicine training in Atlanta, Georgia at Emory University and is dual boarded in EM and EMS. Without further ado, we continue our EMS Week series, Where Have All the STEMIs Gone? Hello and welcome to the EMS Nation podcast. I'm your host, Faison Arshad, and we continue our EMS Week Spectacular series, and we've now flipped it to the West Coast, bringing in two scholars in emergency medicine and EMS and disaster preparedness, Dr. Gregory Gilbert and his EMS fellow, Dr. Brian Sloan. Welcome to the show, guys. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate it. Very excited to be here. Uh, yeah, I just want to start by just saying, you know, happy EMS week. Um, you know, big shout out to uh, law enforcement, um, the firefighters, uh, EMS, EMTs, paramedics, uh, military veterans, and all the volunteers that have been helping us uh, through this COVID crisis. Great. Hopefully we'll all have an opportunity to go back and get our free hospital embroidered pins and uh, pens and uh, crappy barbecue that's given out everywhere for EMS week that we're missing out on this year. That's definitely, I have a page bookmarked. I, I need more barbecue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so 
So uh, what are you guys doing for EMS week? We've had to just postpone kind of like our operations and uh, we're just te testing actually this learning management system to try and give online credits to our folks as well. Uh, yeah, ours is largely, normally we have a big award ceremony, but um, because of sheltering in place, uh, that has been postponed. So um, we are, we're going to, we're kind of doing little video snippets and I'm going to send that out uh, via public uh, media to try to say thanks for all the great, great work they're doing. Absolutely. And Brian, I'd love for you to, um, we have had EMS fellows on the show before doing lectures and things along those lines, but can you just describe to us what the heck is an EMS fellowship and what prompted you to go work with Dr. Gregory Gilbert? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so an EMS fellowship is a really unique training opportunity uh, for emergency physicians to get an extra bit of training in EMS specific issues. So everyone who goes through it is a board eligible or board certified emergency physician. So you've done residency, medical school, basically all of the, the baseline knowledge of an ER doctor is there. And then you take the extra step to do a focused year or two specifically for EMS. So you're still working as an ER doctor, um, but really taking that extra step to work on EMS education, being out in the field, getting to know the paramedics and the leadership for the EMS organizations that you work for. Um, all of that with the goal to be able to take on a role as an EMS medical director in the future. So um, essentially someday I could have uh, a job similar to yours or Greg's. Um, and what inspired me to do this, I was actually an EMT in LA for six years before going to medical school. Uh, you know, I grew up watching emergency probably like every other, um, you know, EMT and paramedic out there and uh, wanted to train at Rampart. So I actually went and did that and worked at Harvard UCLA and realized that, you know, every single fiber of my being, everything that drives me to be an emergency room doctor is based on EMS. And I want nothing more than to spend my career working with uh, pre-hospital care providers. Very exciting. And Dr. Gilbert, do you want to kind of like share the perspective of a fellowship director and a medical director as well? Uh, sure. So I think um, when we decided to get the fellowship uh, up and running, um, we actually, the, the fellowship is actually arguably the oldest one in the country at Stanford. Mm -hmm. uh, it started in 1984. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, I took over the reins and re reignited the fellowship uh, about 2006. And uh, it, one of the common things that you hear in EMS is if you, see, if you have seen one EMS system, then you've seen one EMS system. And one of the beauties of Stanford is, is that we're surrounded uh, by a number of uh, what's co called local EMS agencies. So you get to see a number of different EMS systems. And um, just like in medicine, there's no perfect way of doing, any, uh, doing something. Same thing's true in emergency medical services or EMS. And so I, this gives the fellow a great opportunity to um, kind of compare and contrast uh, all the different uh, ways of kind of uh, handling the problems that come up uh, in an EMS system. Love it. Very exciting. And the topic that we're going to be digging into today is essentially, where have all the patients gone? And I think this is a perspective that many emergency physicians across the country can share, is that total volume has, of course, decreased. And that, in some extent, is expected regarding sheltering in place and social isolation and people essentially, you know, not going to their non-essential jobs. Um, but in regards to critical patient presentations, I think we're also surprised to see a dramatic decrease in the number of heart attacks that are presenting, the number of strokes that are presenting. Uh, traumas in the sense that we kind of expect since people are not out and about, that seems to be more of a sequitur rather than non-sequitur. But where have all the patients gone? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question, and you know we're we're going to kind of go over you know is this just a, a local phenomenon or something that's happened all over the globe, and we'll look at maybe some possible explanations for why that is, and um, and then we'll look at some data, uh, both uh, world data that's been published, and then um, we're actually going to have Brian show off some of our uh, local data here in San Mateo County. So um, we'll uh, we'll explore some possible explanations and and see where it goes. So as we all know, uh, it's called COVID-19 because it was first discovered in uh, 2019 in Wuhan, China. Um, 
And uh, during that time, there was actually some anecdotal reports of uh, COVID-19 kind of causing STEMI-like EKGs. And then, you know, you would take them to the cath lab and they would have clean vessels. And um, so there was a lot of concern um, just around taking these patients to the cath lab. You're exposing all these people that go to the cath lab. Um, and uh, so China actually released some guidance regarding STEMI patients uh, that the U.S. Uh, uh, adopted in um, similar kind of guidelines we'll see in 2000, uh, in March of this year. And then, um, and then despite the fact that it seemed like COVID-19 was going to be causing STEMI-like illness, there was actually a decrease in, in STEMI cases. So as we've been saying, where, where have all the STEMIs gone? Um, so again, so here's a typical EKG, it could be pre-hospital EKG, you know, this would certainly look like a, uh, a STEMI alert and they get to the hospital and, uh, and in the hospital, they snap a chest X-ray and the chest X-ray looks like this. And it's like, well, is this person in gross pulmonary edema or is it COVID-19? And so or this both. Was, <laughs> or both, exactly. And and so this is kind of what led to, this is kind of the anecdotal reports that were coming out. And so China released um, kind of this guidance. Um, uh, they recommended these five things. Obviously, go to the closest center, uh, protect yourself. Um, but um, so they deprioritized um, actually uh, going to the cath lab and actually upped uh, thrombolysis. Um, and then obviously kind of uh, using um, telemedicine. So this is kind of what they recommended from their kind of experience with COVID uh, throughout the month of, of January. And, um, and so as you can see, uh, the United States kind of heard this, and I actually heard about this um, kind of first up when uh, one, of, uh, one of my STEMI patients actually got thrombolytics. And I was like, what the heck? Why, why did that happen? Mm -hmm. And so, that actually prompted us to kind of look at uh, uh, the uh, American College uh, of Cardiology's uh, recommendations during COVID. And you can see actually here that uh, uh, bullet point number three, just like in uh, the previous one, is the decision to proceed with PCI versus thrombolytics versus medical management is based on the on-call interventionalist. And um, Again, it's, uh, I think that it's a judgment call and there was a lot of fear. Remember, this is March. This is just when cases are starting and nobody, you have all these people, you have four or five people that are in the cath lab. They're limiting the number of um, personnel that are going to be in there. And they're also limiting the number of patients. Um, and they're also, you know, intubate those patients in the emergency department, get them on a closed loop system so we don't need to worry about it. So out of curiosity, Dr. Gilbert, was this a patient that was brought in by EMS, if you recall, and he was your patient in the emergency department, and then did you then admit him to the cardiology service or sort of do an internal transfer to the cath lab expecting he would have a primary PCI? So this was actually, as an EMS medical director, we actually were overlooking and watching kind of what's happening on our, um, you'll hear about our Thursday calls uh, shortly, but um, so this went to a different hospital than Stanford. And so I, I was like, wow, is this, are they practicing standard of medicine right now? And, and is this, you know, so I actually brought it to the STEMI committee and we actually came out with these guidelines uh, as a recommendation to our county and all our STEMI centers in San Mateo. And then, so obviously the stay at home uh, orders uh, started getting implemented in uh, March and uh, throughout April. And, and so there was a decline of about 40% uh, percent, uh, in STEMI strokes and other uh, serious illnesses. And that's seen throughout the United States. And, and the rest of the world as well. I mean, well publicized reports out of Italy and Spain showing similar reductions. Exactly. And then, and then I don't think it, so there was a case report. And uh, so there's, you know, it's one person and I'm certain you can find one person who's like, oh, I'm worried about getting COVID-19 from going to the emergency department. But it led to the question of, are people sheltering in place and dying? And so that kind of wanted, led us to kind of look at our data um, and kind of what's going to happen in the uh, kind of going forward. So And so by uh, sheltering in place, we're kind of saying, okay, I'm feeling some chest discomfort. Let me try and take some Mylanta. 
I hope it'll go away. Maybe it's a chest wall strain, but I'd rather not go to the emergency department because I'll definitely catch COVID there. Is that the kind of fear that you're thinking that kind of the general population was espousing? I think that that's what the hospitals are espousing that the general population is, um, is feeling. And I think that that's what we all think. Um, mm. But I think that when we look at our local data, we may come to a different conclusion. Um, the other thing that I think that uh, was interesting is the study that actually came out of Hong Kong that noticed um, decreased treatment time. So because that we're taking all these extra precautions, it's probably not that surprising, but it's actually taking us longer to get door to balloon times than, than we had in the past. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, after you look at this data, is there going to actually be a an increase in STEMIs because of all these people that haven't had STEMIs. But let's take a look at the local data. And I'm gonna turn it over to Brian for that. Yeah, so, you know, big disclaimer as we're going through our local data is our experience with COVID is not the same as everyone else's. Um, I think especially, you know, talking with someone from the East Coast, you guys have had a very different impact than we have. So that's, that's our major disclaimers that we know that our experience is not the same as anyone else's. And just looking at our case numbers here, it's very different than, you know, what we're seeing in New York, what we're seeing in Boston. Um, in San Mateo County, which is where, um, you know, Greg is the uh, county's medical director, um, we've only seen about 1,600 to 1,700 total cases with about 66 deaths. That is vastly lower than what we're seeing in places like New York and, and even other places even on the West Coast like Los Angeles. Um, so as you can see, our overall burden of disease from COVID-19 is fairly low. And that's also the same in Santa Clara County, which is one of our neighboring counties and is much larger. So they've got more than double the population that we have in San Mateo and have still only seen about 2,500 total cases and about 135 deaths. So, you know, that being said, compared to a place like New York City, which is substantially larger, but has had a much, much more significant burden of disease, um, our numbers are, are, are taken against that backdrop of knowing that our case burden is much lower. Now, Brian, just because people are going to be listening to this all over the world, can you kind of describe your testing infrastructure in general? And I know the, you know, percentage uh, or mortality rate is always controversial because people are arguing, well, you know, you really weren't able to test even the symptomatic people because there was a significant limitation here on the state side. And then still, nevertheless, your, you know, mortality rate based on the statistics you're reporting is 4% for San Mateo and almost 5% mm -hmm. for Santa Clara. Right. And we definitely had a lot of struggles early on with the testing capacity, the same that essentially everywhere else in the United States has early on in the outbreak. Um, Santa Clara was actually one of the first places with documented uh, community spread. We had our first death uh, on February 6th from community spread of COVID, um, but we're also very early with the lockdown measures. Mm. So that's what I think is probably driving some of our low case numbers. Um, that being said, we certainly struggles still with testing. Most of our hospitals are able to provide testing for emergency department patients. Um, over the last month or two, it's not uh, been limited to only patients who are being admitted anymore, which had been the prior um, essentially testing threshold. Uh, now at some hospitals, we're able to test any patient. Um, while at others, we still have a significant uh, burden to being able to get those tests. And I'm only able to test patients who are being admitted. So mm. It's, it's variable site to site. That being said, the county has stepped up. There's a lot of community-based testing that's accessible um, in this area. There's also a lot of outpatient clinics that are doing not only PCR testing, but antibody testing, and it has made that more widely available. So over the last three to four weeks, we've seen an exponential growth in our capacity for testing uh, compared to where we were uh, essentially in February, March. Yeah, and I think that we lucked out early on in the in the in the sense that we had um, variant come in and kind of set up uh, drive-through testing both in um, San Mateo and in Santa Clara County. And yes, it was you know, very strict as to who could get the testing, but we actually had that testing early on because we were having some of the first cases. Mm -hmm. And then Stanford actually developed their own test uh, and has developed a number of different tests uh, actually uh, that includes now a rapid test as well as a antibody test. And so, um, <clears throat> We, we are, our, our testing capability is uh, significantly better uh, in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties uh, compared to most, uh, most areas. I would say that uh, 
uh, we are um, one of the leaders uh, when it comes to being able to test people. Hmm. And this is uh, completely tangential, but do you guys have any plans to do antibody testing in first responders specifically? So there is, um, not in our county, uh, there is another county that has an affiliation with Stanford that is looking at doing testing, but with a big disclaimer that they're being very, 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 very forward with the first responders that they're testing that a positive antibody result means nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and we've put a big push on that end saying that, you know, while we are doing the testing, we're recommending that the first responders don't get the results out of the risk of somebody modifying their behaviors. So the tests for antibodies are still not that great. We don't really know what it means. Is a positive antibody test reflective of you know, just an exposure to COVID? Is it reflective of an immune response? Is that immune response protective? We just don't know. Um, and I'll, I'll be totally uh, uh, transparent here and say that I tested positive for antibodies. So I'm very hopeful uh, that it does mean something, but I wouldn't let it change my behaviors. So we're making sure that in anybody, especially in our first responder population that's so at risk of exposure, that we're really, 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 really adamant that these antibody results are purely for epidemiological data and not at all to drive uh, PPE use or return to work or, or anything in that regard. Yeah, in San Mateo County, we're actually discouraging um, getting uh, antibody testing because we really just don't know what it means. Is it a false positive? Is it real? That's kind of uh, Brian and my running joke is, is we spend a lot of time together and I'm antibody negative. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've tested negative twice. So um. <laughs> thank you though so much for the disclaimer. I think that's incredibly important in regards to um, not having false reassurances that you are now immune and you should run into COVID central sans PPE. So it's going to be, especially as we start opening up, and see some possible resurgence in cases after the curve has been effectively flattened that first responders really, really do their due diligence and maintain their PPE now that we've kind of you know, caught up with the disease process. So thanks for underscoring that, guys. Oh, of course. Um, so then moving on to our local data, before I go into our specifics, I did wanna highlight this really interesting survey that ASAP did. Um, looking at the general population's thought processes towards healthcare during the COVID pandemic. Um, and of the people they surveyed, 80% of them, so four out of five, were concerned about catching coronavirus if they went to the ED. So this is underscoring definitely that the public perception of risk of infection in healthcare settings is certainly high. Um, about 29% of those surveyed said that they had avoided medical care due to concerns about COVID-19. So, you know, these are people that may just have some random you know, ear pain one day, or that could be that patient with the exertional chest pain that's sitting at home taking Mylanta and is a ticking time bomb for their mm -hmm. STEMI. Um, more than half of people feel like they have access to testing, but it's just barely more than half. So there's still a large percentage of the population that feels like they don't really have access to testing. Um, and only 80% of people say that they've been following social distancing precautions. So we can see that, you know, the experience of every member of the general public is, is, seems to be very different as well as their perceptions about you know, what's going on in healthcare and what's going on in the world. Um, interestingly, all of that is accumulated into about a 40 to 50% reduction in ED volumes across the country. Um, I know that's pretty similar to what we're seeing here um, in the emergency rooms that I work in. I don't know if it's similar to what you're seeing in New York, but we've had days where our volumes are just fractions of what they were before. And that's not just critical patients, that's any patient who comes in. Um, so one of the thoughts is that this is resulting in more people dying at home. So we actually went back to look at our CARES data, which is the cardiac arrest registry, to see if we've had a significant uptick in people who are dying at home. So um, of all the cardiac arrests that occur out of hospital, if there's any resuscitation attempted, it goes into our CARES database. So this is the, you know, even asystolic arrest, um, the person who's found unresponsive in their home, anybody without, you know, obvious signs of death who wouldn't be resuscitated, rigor mortis, decomposition, anything like that. So we're, we're missing the, that population. Um, that being said, we think if people are dying at home to the degree where essentially we're running across so many more dead bodies that are DOA, we'd expect there to be at least some increase as well in the amount of patients that are being resuscitated. So we're using our CARES data as a surrogate to, to cover both. And we would expect that 
you'd see a rise in both. Um, however, what we found is that in San Mateo County, we've actually had a 26% reduction in out-of-hospital cardiac arrests mm. between January to May 15th compared to prior years. So we've had 125 total this year, and uh, in 2019, we had 169 total year to date. Uh, so it's a pretty significant reduction. Um, now, that being said, when you look at other places, uh, there's a major increase in cardiac arrest calls that go to EMS uh, and a major increase in people who are dying at home. Detroit's had a fourfold increase in out of hospital cardiac arrest. New York had a sixfold increase. Um, for them, uh, looking at uh, prior year's normal uh, you know, day to day operations, they'd see about a 35 um, call volume of cardiac arrest per day in New York City. During COVID, that increased to 200 per day. That is a mind-blowing amount of, of cardiac arrest case increase, um, especially compared to the numbers that we see at our baseline. So I'll definitely chime in there a little bit, Brian, that um, it's just been uh, staggering uh, trying to deal with this, both within New York City and New York State in general. And um, the experience has been incredibly challenging for first responders who, you know, early on were also getting infected um, because PPE was... Um, not readily available. And also we didn't know the appropriate precautions to take, et cetera. And we hadn't standardized the protocol, but yeah, that's absolutely correct. Around 35 per day and it had increased to almost 200 cardiac arrest calls per day, which was staggering. And additionally, just to kind of reflect the general call volume. So New York City EMS sees about 4,000 911 calls per day. And kind of paradoxically to the rest of the country, the EMS call volume increased by, uh, a significant margin to more than 7,000 EMS calls per day during the height of the pandemic, which is um, wow. incredibly challenging for the system to manage. And then you bring in the 200 cardiac arrests. Now you're on scene uh, performing interventions, et cetera. So there were some protocols or pandemic protocols developed by the state, um, which had you know, essentially developed criteria to not even initiate a resuscitation if certain criteria were not met. Thankfully, we're beyond that point now, and PPE is definitely upgraded, and we kind of have an idea how to safely execute um, a cardiac arrest ACLS protocol in pre-hospital sphere, so incredibly challenging. And I yeah, think that, our, that definitely sounds super challenging. And then, so if I saw, uh, so would you say that that increase um, in deaths was the virus, or was it the things that we're worried about, like STEMI stroke, appendicitis? And I think nobody knows, right? So that's why we're talking about this podcast. So should we just form a differential diagnosis and list all the things that are possible just so we can kind of share with EMS Nation the things that are on our mind? Yeah, I think we should. Yeah, so number one, what's on everyone's mind, is this related primarily to COVID-19? Is it causing arrhythmias? Is it causing you know, um, you know, plaque rupture or something within COVID itself, the inflammatory response that is just provoking cardiac arrest in patients. That's, that's really what was for, a forefront in our minds. And I don't think we know the answer. And I don't think anybody knows the answer to this, but I think forming a helpful differential diagnosis will be good. Yeah, no, I th and I think that that might be it too. I mean, the, there's COVID definitely causes a lot of interesting things. And we're definitely seeing uh, right now, there's a lot of reports about pediatric patients having multi-organ system failure uh, from COVID-19. So, um, you know, as we keep saying, we're learning more and more about this virus every day. And, uh, but one of the things that, you know, as I was mentioning in the beginning is we do know it causes vasculitis. And um, so it can cause uh, symptoms of, of heart attack and stroke and all these other things because of that vasculitis, but there's actually nothing, uh, not the usual pathway for why that happens. So I think your increase in number of patients actually implies that it's probably the virus that's leading to that because in our area where we haven't had that much virus, we've actually had a significant decrease. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely right. And I think our data um, really follows that up is, you know, we've had a fairly limited impact from the virus in our area, but we've had that same decrease in ED volumes and also had a decrease in our EMS call volume followed with a decrease in deaths at home. So I think, you know, we can definitely see that, you know, there's some amount of, of decrease in the overall disease burden just in general in our population. Um, 
but without the virus circulating widely causing all these side effects, we're not seeing that same extreme burden that you guys are seeing in New York. Yeah, and then of course we talk about sheltering in place and deferring care. You know, I'm having this chest discomfort. I should would normally go to the emergency department, but there's no way I would risk getting COVID um, by traveling outside my home or violating my sheltering in place, you know. So the question is, is that leading to then, you know, increasing myocardial ischemia and infarction and then ultimately, you know, VTAC, VFib arrest? Well, I almost wonder if those patients actually maybe already have COVID. They are, you know, they have that silent hypoxia. I love and that. I'm actually, so glad you brought that up. I really want to get into the silent hypoxia. And maybe that is leading to increased risks for, you mm-hmm. know, their STEMI and stroke, because obviously, um, you know, we have lots of people running around with angina, a stable angina, and this would certainly push them over the edge. So I wonder if that also may play a role in this whole thing. So let's pause that there. So they have underlying coronary artery disease or risk factors. Um, and then the silent hypoxia, just to describe it more, it's, it was just flabbergasting to see these patients who are actually, you know, relatively well appearing. They're coming in with, you know, I've seen patients, O2 saturations, 60%, 70% who are texting on the phone. And that paradoxical image of what we would expect with a severely dyspneic patient, tachypneic, subcostal retractions, working hard to breathe, tripoding example you know, with it to correlate with that O2 saturation. It was just an incredible juxtaposition of seeing that O2 sat of 60, 70% and the patient's just in bed texting. Yeah, I don't know if I'd be able to text if I was looking at somebody with an O2 sat of 60%. You know, that would get my heart racing. That's, that's wild. So how many of, you know, it's not like everyone has, you know, portable pulse oximeters at home, even though they're on like, you know, 15 to $20, but you know, I would imagine there's a large amount of the population in these very dense areas, like you're mentioning, Brian, Detroit and New York City, that were just walking around with O2 sats in the 80s and maybe low 90s. That could have tipped them over the edge, absolutely. Well, yeah, just yeah, a little and that's bit. Why we're not, and that's why we're not seeing it here in California, is because we only have a thousand people with the disease. And, um, and I almost think that with the sheltering in place, one of the theories that we have uh, here in, in California is, is that maybe um, our reduction is, is that people aren't as stressed out as much. They're not going to the gym. They're not rupturing their plaques. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not spending time with family. <laughs> <laughs> or more time with family, though. You know, like that's the flip right. side. True, true. Another um, hypothesis I had was, is it viral load? So one person brings it into the household. Now everyone has it. So could there be a correlation with viral load? Now there's, you know, everyone in the, in the same household that's sheltering in place has a virus. So could potentially there be a correlation with viral load and, and disease processes? And then again, I know you guys are going to get into it, but the thromboembolic phenomenon that are associated with COVID are just, you know, I can't wait until we get more understanding or a better understanding of this process because, you know, we've seen like 27, 28 year olds with large vessel occlusions, which just. Oh, I had an 18 year old the other day. 18 year old healthy kid playing football and uh, suddenly, you know, had stroke like symptoms and a uh, really spectacular paramedic um, did not brush off his symptoms, took it really seriously, brought him to the comprehensive stroke center. And uh, he, you know, fortunately doesn't have any major deficits afterwards, but yeah, it's, it's absolutely happening. It's happening to young, healthy people post COVID. Scary stuff. Scary, scary stuff. Any other hypotheses? I thought that was a great list. Uh, no, I think, I, I've, I think those are. I think those are most of it. Um, although, I, you know, obviously with the uh, multi-organ failure that we're starting to see, um, you know, again, we're just learning mm-hmm. about this virus uh, day in and day out, and and kind of its its uh, after effects uh, as well. Uh, and yeah, I guess because obviously it's kind of like uh, Kawasaki's disease, which again kind of goes back to this vasculitis. So. Right. And there's been some thoughts, uh, you know, especially with the initial SARS virus, um, that there's some type of binding domain or an increase in binding domain, is particularly in atherosclerotic areas of vessels. So mm-hmm. if you've got someone who's already got tight vessels with a lot of plaque in them, now those vessels get inflamed, you get that vasculitis component. Mm-hmm. Um, and for whatever reason, the virus is, is binding more at sites that have those, those significant plaque deposits. You've gone from a situation that was bad into a situation that's now much more severe. That level of inflammation around a, you know, a 70% coronary artery blockage, it's not going to end well. Mm. 
And I'll, I'll say this here, even though I think that um, there's been studies that have said this isn't the case, but um, there's at least seven or eight different versions of COVID-19 going mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. and, and I have this theory that the, the one that came from China that, that uh, ended up in California early on was not nearly as infective or as deadly as the one that kind of went through Europe and then ended up in New York State. East Coast, yeah. On the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And and so I have this, this theory that that strain's a little bit more deadly than the one that came over directly from China. Um, and that I think that, you know, kind of the increased numbers that we're seeing in Los Angeles might be an example of people traveling from New York to, to Los Angeles. But uh, again, supposedly there's studies that say that that isn't the case, but I have a sneaky suspicious suspicion. Yeah. And the, and the fundamental concept you're highlighting there, Dr. Gilbert, is uh, when we parallel to influenza, is both antigenic shift as well as antigenic drift. So right. within, within a particular season, the virus is going to be mutating as it goes from host to host. And then year over year, there can be even more subsequent or um, more substantial uh, changes or mutations to the virus itself that can either increase the um, pathogenic um, properties of it or even decrease it you know so it's it's all a roll of the dice and especially exactly. in this virus which is an rna virus so mm -hmm. it's even more unstable even more prone to mutating so you know that what we're learning about the virus now might not even be the case from what we're seeing clinically six months from now and brian that is that because it's single stranded as an rna as opposed to double stranded that it's you know it can mutate faster is that what you're suggesting Yes, because it doesn't go through the same, essentially, proofreading that a double-stranded DNA virus would go through. The single-stranded RNA viruses um, are essentially, they, they skip the host cell's proofreading process, which is naturally built into the uh, you know, genomic material in all of our normal cells. Uh, but when you have an RNA virus, it doesn't go through the same uh, really tight proofreading. So you could get a viral particle that's repackaged and, and is now infectious again that's got entirely I don't want to say entirely different DNA sequence, but significantly different DNA sequence almost every single time. Mm. Fascinating. Yeah. And so, you know, going forward, there could be COVID-20, COVID-21, <laughs> new, uh, new versions uh, kind yeah. of mutate and become the new infective uh, thing that's going around the world. Right. So uh, why don't we talk a little bit about um, the specific decreases we've seen in standing numbers, if that's okay with uh, both of you gentlemen. Um, there was actually recently a really good paper done by uh, Garcia et al. that looked at nine different high volume STEMI centers across the United States. So they looked at centers on the East Coast, on the West Coast, um, throughout the country that were very large volume STEMI centers, something like, you know, 100 STEMI activations a day, uh, I believe. Some really large amount um, in areas that were both hot spots and areas that were uh, less impacted by the virus. And despite the fact that these cities were very different in their populations, very different in their impact of COVID, uh, overall, they all saw the same similar reduction in STEMI activations. And they looked at overall, there was a 38% reduction in all STEMI activations. Um, and this is pretty similar to Spain, which saw a 40% reduction over the same time period. So, you know, just like we were talking about, there's definitely less STEMI activations. Now, does that mean that patients are having less STEMIs you know, we don't know. We're definitely seeing some delayed care. I know, Greg, I don't know if you've well, seen think, any patients. Well, I think we could say in San Mateo County, we're not seeing, we're not seeing as many STEMI patients and they're not dying at home uh, as right. there's been a reduction in both. But I think, you know, so if I was to think about New York and again, Faisan's going to be better to answer this question at the, but, you know, is the silent hypoxia so quick that they go from STEMI to, you know, just V-fib, cardiac arrest, and death. And that's my question. Because otherwise, they would still have the same symptomology, right? Oh, I'm having this crushing chest pain. I'm going to call 911, which obviously there's an increased volume, but there's still this 40% this reduction in STEMI activation. So, Yeah, and I wonder if the New York City coroner's office may have you know, literature coming out in the future just looking at the postmortems on these patients that pass at home and seeing uh, kind of what exactly is going on within the coronary arteries themselves. So, right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. if we go back to, you know, kind of the, you know, our first couple of slides that showed that this patient was having STEMI, but also having COVID, you know, and they end up getting cath and they're clean. Is that going to be attributed to a STEMI or is that attributed to COVID even though mm -hmm. 
So it's, uh, it's very uh, interesting to see um, how that will all play out. Perfect. So uh, moving on from stemming on to stroke, you know, as we were talking about, there's been certainly an increase in the amount of patients with um, LVO strokes, younger patients that are healthier. Um, you know, there's also been a decrease in the amount of patients presenting with the more classic stroke. They, uh, all critical patients seem to be decreasing. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find a specific set number that's been published yet, but anecdotally, uh, I've certainly seen a decrease in the amount of strokes um, at least initially during the pandemic. Now, as we're starting to see more post-COVID thromboembolic disease, I'm starting to see more of an uptick again. But initially, I saw a major decrease in my stroke volume. I don't know, uh, for both of you, have you seen something similar at your shops, especially early on during the response? Uh, and so I can definitely say from a stroke standpoint in San Mateo County, there's been a decrease in strokes during this period of time as well. Um, I was talking with, anecdotally again, with um, one of the neurologists. And again, we think that just sheltering in place doesn't lead to this, um, to the rupturing of plaques or, or um, for whatever reason, it's been protective and it's not really clear why. Uh, but again, I think in New York, they've probably had a different experience. Yeah, I subjectively have seen decreased stroke volume, but then you get the COVID stroke and these patients are just profoundly sick. So I don't have like... Um, metadata to discuss, but it's a fascinating topic of conversation. Absolutely. All right. Now, moving on to trauma, there was an uh, interesting study out of New Zealand recently that showed that the amount of trauma patients that they're seeing has also been significantly reduced. Fairly similar, actually, to the decrease in volume that they've seen across the world in STEMI activations. So, uh, this group uh, with Christy out of New Zealand saw an overall 43% reduction in any injury-related admissions. So that's anywhere from, you know, uh, grandma fell down in the bathroom and broke her hip, all the way up to the multi-organ system trauma from the major high-speed motor vehicle accident. So across all injury admissions, we've seen the same reduction. So, you know, that's telling us, you know, these patients who are severely traumatized very acutely, who don't really have the option to you know, reduce or, or, or avoid going to the emergency room, um, these injuries just aren't happening at the same frequency, which makes sense, right? Most of us are in some form of a shelter in place order or a lockdown. So, you know, fortunately, there's not a lot of people up on the roofs after six beers trying to fix their, you know, Christmas lights in the rain during a thunderstorm. Um, we're not seeing that the same frequency we used to, but you know, how long is that going to last? People are going to start getting bored inside their houses. When we have the lifting of the shelter in place orders, are these traumas going to come back? And my thought is that they will. I think that as humans, we don't really have the ability to avoid traumatizing ourselves um, and avoiding that for a prolonged period of time. So I'm suspicious it would, it's, it's going to bounce back as um, orders are lifted or that people start getting more bored. Yeah, no, trauma will definitely go back up, <clears throat> for sure. I mean, all of them will, will certainly go back up at some point. Um, but trauma in particular makes a lot of sense. Uh, the thing that's interesting on, on uh, traumatic injuries being reduced the same as STEMI and stroke is, why is that the same? You would think that that would not be the same. But mm. um, I, I don't have a good explanation for that, um, Faisan or Brian. I think, I think trauma I can sit easier with. Like it doesn't really like provoke this angst in me. I, I can kind of see that more as a logical consequence of shelter. Absolutely. In place. But um, while I have you guys on the line, I cannot resist um, but asking you about regionalizations and how do you guys approach these types of protocols? Because Brian, I heard you talk about the comprehensive stroke center and the paramedic made a decision based on likely a stroke severity scale to... Um, proceed to the uh, thrombectomy-capable um, hospital. And then we talked also about trauma. So can you guys talk a little bit about regionalization uh, protocols within your system, kind of independent of COVID? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have two uh, very different systems which we work in. So Greg's the medical director for San Mateo County, so I'll let him talk about how San Mateo does it. Um, but uh, where I work in the ED is in Santa Clara County, which has a very fundamentally different system. Um, and we, of course, have a really 
you know, well-established system of comprehensive versus primary stroke centers as most of the world does now. Um, but in terms of routing our pre-hospital activations, we're actually using a stroke scale that's independent of time uh, called the BFAST scale, where patients over a certain score are gonna be taken to the comprehensive stroke center versus the primary stroke center. Um, in my experience, it seems to be working reasonably well. Uh, we still get a lot of transfers at the comprehensive stroke centers, uh, but there's definitely some cases of patients with, um, you know, LVO symptoms and the appropriate presentation that bypass primary stroke centers going to the comprehensive that do seem to benefit. Uh, that being said, you know, one system is not the same as another system. So, you know, when Greg talks about San Mateo, knowing that the system in San Mateo versus Santa Clara, even though we're geographically very similar, um, is a very different design and works well for, for that particular county. Yeah. And so, yeah, in San Mateo County, we actually use a time-based um, system. Uh, and uh, like I said in the beginning, one of the unique things about the Stanford Fellowship is you get to compare and contrast. And, and, and so with a time-based system, uh, three and a half hours goes to the uh, closest primary stroke center, which includes the thrombectomy capable and comprehensive. We have all three available in our system. Uh, <clears throat> after three and a half hours out to nine hours, uh, it goes to the comprehensive or thrombectomy capable centers. Mm. And um, I actually would have actually preferred to have that continue on to 24 hours. Um, but uh, interestingly, one of the primary stroke centers um, uh, was uh, argued that losing 11 patients in the course of a year was enough for them to go and purchase the software that helps them to determine who should be a large vessel occlusion or not. And so even though there's only about 15 patients that fall in that nine hour to 24 hour, so it would certainly not overwhelm a comprehensive stroke center, which has often been said as the reason why not to do uh, that extended window. Um, <clears throat> that loss of three or four patients per month would have been huge to the primary stroke center. So I actually drew a line in the sand at nine. And so we, um, uh, all of the primary stroke centers will actually do a, a rapid um, <clears throat> perfusion study. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that way further risk stratify those patients that have a large vessel occlusion or not. Uh, we are also looking at trying to use um, a stroke scale. Uh, but as we all know, there isn't a perfect one and it's about 80% accurate. So. Um, we've yet to we've yet to settle on one. And it, other than another, the uh, other than the Cincinnati Hospital Stroke Scale, and another major benefit, you know, that allows us to be able to have a system like this for our regionalization is that we have a huge amount of healthcare resources in this area. Our hospitals are well equipped in terms of not only their capacities but their specialist availability. So um, while one hospital may be a you know, primary stroke center, they're able to afford and, 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 you know, acquire that software so they can do the rapid perfusion studies. The payer mix is good for the hospital. So even if you don't necessarily have the accreditation to be a comprehensive stroke center or the thrombectomy capability, they're able to really get the ball rolling for these patients so that by the time they identify an LVO and transfer them, the time difference is, is not that much. But this is dramatically different from where I did my residency, where um, a lot of the community hospitals are, are extremely under-resourced and would never have the capacity to do that. They would essentially, uh, you know, do DPA and you know, drip and ship um, mm -hmm. if they were able to determine if an LVO was there. But a lot of them, you know, getting a CT perfusion study is, is a big ask. So we're very fortunate in our system to be able to, you know, apply these rules and, and benefit from the hospital capability, but it's not going to fly everywhere. That's for sure. And, uh, you know, um, we're still waiting to kind of see what the data shows, but in San Mateo County, we have a, a mobile stroke unit, which also will be a, a game changer if it can identify large vessel occlusions uh, and should be able to identify large vessel occlusions a lot more accurately than any of the stroke scales. That's got, this is a controversial topic. Um, and I know in the EMS <laughs> world, uh, the stroke ambulances are kind of, you know, they're proponents and there are a lot of uh, folks who are not so keen on the idea and see it more I, I can't I I have I used to be one of the this is the dumbest ideas and um, we've treated over five or six patients within the golden hour on the mobile stroke unit which never happens inside the hospital mm -hmm. and 
I am I'm becoming a believer in the mobile stroke unit. I hate to believe, I hate to admit that, okay. but I but that I that has al always been one of my arguments is that if you're doing point of care laboratory testing, you're putting the patient in the CT scanner. That's fine and well, but if you're able to now do a CT angiogram and identify the LVO, that actually changes your medical decision making and affects your transport decisions. So that has the potential to really um, be a game changer. Yeah, all of that I think is game changing, and you can start giving the medicine right there in the in the mobile stroke unit as well. And if I mean, so there's those two things, and we are not even talking about how it can pick up bleeding, right? So those should mm -hmm. be going to comprehensive stroke mm -hmm. centers. And so again, a game changer in the sense that you can accurately identify who's having a hemorrhagic stroke versus the more typical ischemic stroke. Right, and, just, and get blood pressure control and, and you know, airway management if necessary. It's, it's a huge difference. So just to dig into those topics, just a very tiny bit. So um, what Dr. Gilbert was mentioning, so why do bleeds need to go to comprehensive stroke centers? And it's because the interventional neurologist, let's say it's a ruptured subarachnoid, can then also perform an intervention and clip and coil that vessel. And then what Brian is referring to is actually an element of crew resource management or CRM because the makeup or composition of the potential ambulances is different. It's not uh, simply a paramedic and EMT you're gonna have. What is a uh, CRM or, or crew uh, management within the ambulance that you guys deploy? So um, go ahead, Brian. We have a paramedic, an EMT, uh, a nurse, an RN, as well as the uh, CT tech. Um, and then they'll sometimes have the stroke neurologist in person on the ambulance and then often have her via telemedicine. And then in San Mateo, just to kind of get back to regionalization, which is where this, this topic was actually uh, headed, is uh, San Mateo actually inside our borders does not actually have a trauma center. So in the north half of the county, um, they will go to um, Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, and in the south, they, they head to Stanford University. Nice. Yeah. All right, dentistry. Yeah. So, you know, I brought this one up actually for a little bit of a personal reason. So my wife is a oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Okay. Um, and right now their clinic is closed. They're not doing elective cases. And she's seen a really significant increase in the amount of people who are showing up with complications from dental problems, infections, abscesses. I mean, things that are as simple as just my tooth hurts. If I eat something cold, you know, all the way up to a life threatening infection of the face and neck that can, you know, kill somebody very quickly. So I wanted to see, you know, is this just her experience in San Francisco or is this something that's being echoed across the world? And I think actually there was this paper that I found, you know, while it does apply to dentistry, I think it applies to a lot of things. And this is the first thing that really truly showed the impact of decreased access to care or people putting off care and having more complications. So uh, this clinic in China, that was essentially a very large dental urgent care clinic. Uh, that essentially available for walk-ins or appointments, people come in for whatever dental complaint they have. During the COVID outbreak, they saw 38% fewer patients. So, you know, this is in line with what we're seeing in emergency rooms and um, outpatient clinics across the country. There's been a major decrease in people seeking care. But what they did notice also with that is that the amount of people who came in with an infection um, and that's related to somebody not having their routine dental care done. Mm -hmm. That increased from about 50% of patients almost to 72% of patients. So that's a pretty major change. And the patients who came in with dental trauma, so a chipped tooth, um, some you know, damage to their teeth they needed to have repaired, decreased from about 14% to about 10%. So of those patients you're missing who aren't coming in for the routine dental care, those are the ones who are going on to develop infections, to develop these potentially life-threatening complications that now need to come in and get more aggressive management, uh, a filling uh, that could have been done at an outpatient dentist's office beforehand now turns into a you know, multi-hour long surgical debridement mm -hmm. and an ICU admission. So we're really seeing, you know, in, in the field of dentistry where things happen a little bit faster, we've really been able to measure the fact that this decreased access to care is absolutely causing worse outcomes. Yeah, I think that this really puts an exclamation point on that. <clears throat> um, and if you think care, about yeah. it, sheltering in place doesn't mean that you're not going to keep eating. So I think that, you know, you're still going to have bad dental care and in the sense that you won't be flossing or you might not be brushing your teeth. And so I think that it shows that, um, you know, if you're doing your normal daily activities, uh, that your dentist, that your, you know, tooth care is going to be impacted the way this is. I think it's interesting that this is different than 
um, what we've seen with STEMI and stroke. Uh, yes. And again, I think maybe that's due to less stress because we're sheltering in place, less activity. Is that what we're gonna say? Yeah, this is fascinating. And I'm so glad uh, you uh, included this slide as um, uh, so many interesting takeaways there. So in China, we have to remember that there's a much higher baseline prevalence of uh, tobacco consumption too. Uh, in comparison to other um, westernized countries. So I wonder what effect that has. And just straight boredom. Um, mm -hmm. So if these sm <laughs> smokers are at home, they have nothing to do, you know, I, I wonder if there's a correlation with increased tobacco consumption as well. And this is mm -hmm. uh, kind of a fun fact, personal fun fact, but um, there was a study that came out maybe in 2010 through 2012, somewhere in like that timeline that tightly correlated um, you know, dental decay with the incidence of MI and correlated it with um, CRP or C-reactive protein, kind of hypothesizing that um, elevated CRP was noted in patients who had poor dental care. And those patients also had a, a proportionally higher incidence of myocardial infarction. So it's that chronic inflammatory state. And we know that COVID itself is a super inflammatory or cytokine response too. So it's so fascinating how you might think that just one organ system that doesn't really fit in or related to COVID may in fact be very tightly correlated with COVID too. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. It's, the amount of knowledge that we've been able to, as, as a profession, build within the last couple of weeks to months is astronomical. And I think, you know, if we're going to take one positive thing away from any of this, it's how fast we're able to learn. You know, as, as healthcare providers, as physicians, as first responders, we went from in November, business as usual, to now going through everything we've been through, but the amount of learning and, and knowledge that's come out of that has just been uh, astronomical and, and, and really puts a little bit of a, a positive spin on all of this, is how fast we're able to learn, how fast we're able to research, how much information we're able to ascertain from a crisis. It's been really good to see. And if I can take an opportunity just to kind of um, ask you guys a couple of questions to conclude is um, most folks may not realize this, but with the, you know, as you said, business as usual, you know, medicine in itself, maybe not in California, there's a different model, but medicine is also a business. And with emergency department volumes down, you know, 40 to 50% across the country, there are many emergency physicians who are on the front lines who are also having shifts reduced and are being furloughed and are being temporarily, you know, taken off, you know, the roster, which I think may, you know, fascinate or, you know, be completely, um, you know, not obvious to the lay population. But as you guys prepare, especially California, I know the governor has kind of given you some guidance county by county um, to take the lead to open up uh, business, what would be your message uh, to first responders and lay people in regards to visiting the emergency department if they do have, you know, urgent needs or, you know, things that need to be addressed? Um, yeah, I'll take that. <clears throat> I'll take that one first. Uh, you know, I think that the emergency departments are safe. Um, there, we are really good about screening our patients. We do rapid tests on pretty much everyone that comes. And, um, you know, we kind of have hot, warm, and cold zones, and depending on what your complaint is, we, you know, put you in those areas. But I, I know that the public perception is it's a good place to catch COVID nineteen, but it's it's not true, um, at least not not in um, not in the hospitals here in California. I'm sure the same is probably true there in New York, Isa. Yeah, absolutely. We're working to dispel those myths. We've just developed tremendous infrastructure to make it an incredibly safe place. Um, for everyone. And, you know, of course, we finally caught up by flattening the curve on our PPE. So, you know, we're able to don and doff PPE and change it uh, regularly for each patient and uh, make sure that not only the providers are safe in hospital and out of hospital, but also that we're not, you, we're not ourselves vectors of infection for the lay population. Right. And, and all of that's come out of learning more. I mean, in the initial stages of this, it probably was risky to be in the hospital or in the ER when we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know how prevalent it was. We didn't know what the presentations were. But now we've learned. We can recognize COVID. We have the PPE. We know how to take it on and off. We have access to it. We really put in the change to make it safer, not only for the patients, but for our providers. And when you look at some of the studies out of New York recently, uh, looking at antibody prevalence as a marker of exposure to COVID, healthcare workers, frontline healthcare workers have lower rates of antibody seroconversion. So if our healthcare workers are having lower rates of infection, 
then we could assume that our patients are probably having lower rates of infection inside the hospitals as well. Because we're using our PPE right, we're thinking about it, we've learned from you know, the initial crisis to be able to get into a place where we're sustainable and safe. And I think uh, for me as a physician and a, you know, a frontline healthcare worker, I feel comfortable going to work. I feel comfortable and safe. And I wouldn't have necessarily said that at the very beginning of the outbreak, but I say that now, and I think I'll say that going forward, no matter what happens, because we've been able to learn what to do and to do it right. Yeah. And I think uh, the message for first responders is, you know, set a good example for the public, you know, obviously wear your mask uh, when it's appropriate uh, and, and a cloth uh, mask is, is perfectly fine. And when you're taking care of patients, obviously you don and, don and doff your PPE correctly and you have little to no chance of getting the of COVID-19. That's what we've seen over the last three months. It's been an absolutely amazing conversation, guys. I'd love to just give you the opportunity. Do you have any final words for our audience? Any pro tips as EMS medical directors you have? Um, or also just like how can folks um, get in touch with you if you have questions or maybe um, folks want to come to a rotation with you or prospective uh, EMS fellows? How should folks get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, so um, the first thing I, I will put a plug in for, because I came up with this idea back in 2002, Brian knows where this is going, uh, is the drive through triage. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity during the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, you know, you stay inside your car. It's been uh, implemented all over the, uh, over the world. I've seen it uh, used in a number of different places. We, we re-resurrected it here at Stanford. Um, and it's just a safe way to kind of test patients uh, and kind of get a good kind of medical screening exam. And uh, so I was really, really excited to see that idea come to fruition um, uh, during this pandemic. And I've, it seems to have worked really, really well. And if people are interested in getting in touch with me, uh, my email address is uh, ghgilbert, G-I-L-B-E-R-T, at stanford.edu. And I would... Uh, I would look forward to talking with you further about any uh, and all opportunities, whether it's a rotation or uh, just talking about uh, COVID related things or emergency medical services in general. Absolutely. And happy EMS week to all of our first line providers and, you know, know that we're always looking out for you uh, on the medical director side and, and we're proud of all the work you guys are doing. Please keep staying safe, using your PPE and finding ways to, uh, keep saying during all of this crisis. Yeah, happy EMS week, everybody. Thanks so much for everything you guys do. You guys are our heroes uh, all the way. All right, and with that, this is Brian Sloan, Gregory Gilbert, and Faison Arshad wishing everyone a safe tour. <laughs>